uh, to this day. He is happily married to uh, Tita Joy. Tita Joy, where are you? Thank you for joining us. You just wave to everybody so you could be recognized and blessed with three children. So without further delay, let's give a warm welcome to Pastor Dr. Larry Fabiona. Thank you, Philip. Wow, good morning, folks. Yeah, I speak a bit loud, so you might have to adjust the volume. Thank you for uh, granting my request to shorten the intro. You see, the original intro was so crazy, only two people could have written it. One is my wife, the other is our black Labrador retriever. And, uh, you know, had he read it the way it was written, it would sound crazy. But I bring you greetings from your brethren at GCF Ortigas, which in one sense is really your mother church, no? Uh, we have that common bond of Dr. Luis Pantoja as... Uh, Philip mentioned, that was Philip, that very convincing guy who made us both uh, land in the ministry. And, uh, you know, last night I was with uh, Grace, Philip, some of your staff, Pastor Mao, and we were talking about this church. And it's amazing when I, you know, recall how Philip, uh, a few years ago, I think it was 2022 or 2021, he just said, Pastor Larry, could you pray about GCF Ortigas? helping us with a project. And I said, okay, let me take it to my elders and pastors. We'll pray about it. And, uh, you know, to make the story short, this project is this building you're sitting in. And when he told me their target, I said, wow, these people are aiming for the moon. But look at where you are. So that's why I told Philip, Philip, I'm going to mention it in the sermon today. That hearing about Subic Bay Community of Faith is great, but seeing this is overwhelming. Really, when I came in here this morning, I was looking as overwhelmed. I mean, G. C. Ortigas gave a tiny, minuscule contribution. I really call it that, to help. But you people were used by God to bring you where you are. And, you know, that's why when uh, Shirley arranged with my wife for me to come here, I was asking myself, what do you tell a, a, a group of people who are mostly first-generation Christians, which is impressive, by the way, what do you tell them? And I ask myself, I want to tell them what I would tell my own three children. I want to tell them what I want my church family called Greens Christian Fellowship to know. I want to tell you something, Subic Bay Community of Faith, that is dear to my heart. And this is the topic today. Three precious truths Every Christian must know. And uh, let's open it with a prayer. Father, thank you for everything so far. That, that singing was just wonderful. Thank you, Lord, to be reminded to sing together. And if God be for us, then who can stand against us? And if God is with us, then who can stand against? Thank you for that reminder of the limitless power we have in Christ. Thank you, Father, that we are in a place where that is not just sung about, that this place shows it, demonstrates it, proves it. And thank you, Lord, for this, this wonderful family here of Subic Bay Community of Faith. Wonderful to hear that many are first-generation Christians. Some are perhaps from other countries or worshiping with us, Father, singing with the same voice, worshiping with the same heart. Now, Father, we ask your Holy Spirit to guide our study in your word, that as we read it and study it together, you would be honored, you'd be exalted, because we have nothing to talk about except Christ and Him crucified and Him risen and Him returning and Him ruling in our lives. Be honored today, Father. We have no one to talk about but Christ. And may every heart here be warmed anew, be refreshed anew by the reality and wonder of our salvation that only Christ could have given us. And Lord, in case there's anyone here who has not yet ever come to faith, may this be a day of new birth for that man or woman who's here with us, whatever, wherever they came from. And we ask this all for the glory of your name, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, do you have your Bibles with you? Well, I, I know you have. So could you please rise with me because I'm going to read for you our scripture reading. Uh, 
It's, it's okay if you haven't uh, brought it on screen. I did not put it in my PowerPoint. That's my fault. But our scripture reading is in the passage I mentioned about, which is Ephesians chapter 1. And we'll be beginning from verse 16 all the way to verse 21. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 to 21. Let me read this for you. If you have any Bible version, it's fine. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Paul was speaking here. He said, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. God bless the reading of the sir. Please be seated. Ephesians 1, 16 to 21 is actually a prayer. It, it's not directly a prayer, but Paul was saying, this is how I pray for you. This is the content of my prayer. And what Paul was praying for is very, very specific. Uh, it's a bit worded difficult, uh, in a difficult way, whether in the English or the original, in the Greek. It's actually one long sentence in the Greek. So let me just paraphrase it for us uh, who are simple mortals like me. Paul was basically saying in verses 16 to 18, Ephesians, I care about you so much that I'm praying for one specific thing that God will give you as a blessing. What is that blessing? That the Ephesians will be enlightened by God's Holy Spirit. So let me try out if this works. It's not working. Okay, uh, could somebody just move forward the slide, please? There you go. Okay, so let's we'll stay there. So... Basically, that's what Paul is praying for, for the Ephesians. Now, why was he doing this? The Ephesians were not a troubled church. I mean, if you've been reading the rest of the Bible, if Pastor Ma has taken you perhaps through them, the Corinthians were a troubled church. The Galatians were a troubled church. The Ephesians were not really a troubled church, but they needed instruction in sound doctrine. So in the first three chapters of Ephesians, you're, you're listening to Paul. If you're reading it, he's actually telling the Ephesians, this is what God has done for you, folks. That's what he's saying to them. This is the richness of God's grace. So it's like a lecture in doctrine. And uh, young folks, doctrine, if it's boring, it's not the Bible's fault. It's our fault, okay? It's the pastor's fault. Doctrine is very interesting. That's what Paul did. He taught in the first three chapters of Ephesians the doctrine of grace. This is what God's done for you. That, that's why the famous verses there, you know, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, for by grace you've been saved through faith, because that's his main theme. You need to know what God has done for you through Christ. And then uh, Ephesians 4 to 6, he goes on to say, okay, because God has saved you wonderfully, powerfully. He said, no, this is how you live. So Ephesians 4 to 6 is like a manual of how to live how to run a church, how to be good parents, and so on. So why am I dealing now with Ephesians chapter 1? Because it's part of the doctrinal section, where Paul is actually telling the Ephesians, you need to know this. You must know this. I mean, you, it's like saying to them, you're much poorer spiritually if you don't know this. So let's get to that then. And before I go into the details... I remember reading about a, a famous media mogul, you know, a multimillionaire who made his millions in uh, the newspaper industry. His name was William Randolph Hearst. Uh, he died around the late 50s, but William Randolph Hearst, like many, many multimillionaires, you know, he wanted to invest his money in things that would perhaps bring him a lot of pleasure. So William Randolph Hearst spent a lot of his money collecting expensive art treasures from all over the world. So, can you imagine it? Here's this guy who has loads of money. He's going to use it to collect his favorite art treasures from all over the world. So he tells his, uh, his men, I want you to get this art treasures I saw. 
I read about them. They're wonderful. I don't care how much they cost. You bring them to me. So William Randall first sent out his men. They went throughout the earth, spent a lot of money, spent a lot of time, many months scouring the earth for the art treasures. And finally, the, his men came to him and said, uh, Sir, we found what you were looking for. He said, Okay, where is it? How much does it cost? They said, you don't have to spend a cent, sir. It's actually in your stock room. So shocking. William Randolph Hearst uh, spent a lot of money, a lot of time looking for treasures that he thought was not his, but was actually in his stock room. Had he bothered friends to read his inventory, he would have seen, I already own those. Now, where am I leading to? Sometimes we're like that. You know, we, we, we say, God, I, I really want to feel that you are with me. Lord, I want you to give me hope. Lord, I want you to make me seem how my worth as a person. Lord, I want you to help me. You know what God is saying? Son, daughter, read my word. Uh, that's your inventory of assets, my son, my daughter. My word is where your inventory of assets are. Ephesians chapter 1 is one of those. And God is telling us to the Apostle Paul, if you're talking about feeling helpless, I hopeless, I mean, or, or worthless, or helpless, you don't need to. You've got all the treasures that God could ever give you. And that's the point of our message today, friend. That's why Paul prayed very specifically. And if you forget everything I'll say today, you re just remember this. It's good. Our hope, our worth, our help for living in this world are all in Christ. Our hope, our worth as people, our help for living in this world are all in Christ. Christ. Now, let me just go through our passage today by small sections. When we feel hopeless, what we're learning is, now let me see if this works. There you go. When we feel hopeless in Christ, God has given us hope that never ends. That's found in Ephesians 1.18. It says in Ephesians 1.18 that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. I know the question. Uh, what hope are you talking about? What hope is Paul talking about? Well, that's the importance of context. Now, if, if you have your Bibles, if you could just go a little, you know, up in Ephesians 1, 7 to 8, that's where, where Paul talks about the hope that we have, and that is our salvation. Ephesians 1, 7 to 8, Paul said, In Him, in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us. Our hope, my friends, for everything in this life is because of our salvation. All other hope just springs from it. It all just comes from it, friends. And that's the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. That hope, my dear friends, is actually because salvation is the guarantee of our ultimate victory in Christ. Uh, okay, thank you. At Romans 8.23, it's on screen. But we ourselves, Paul was telling the Romans, groan inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saying, what is Paul saying? He's saying... Our hope in this life comes from the fact that we will ultimately be saved. What does salvation mean again? Just a quick review. Salvation, my being saved by Christ, your being saved by Christ, is three things. It's not just the one thing you always think it is. It's three, not one. First, it's salvation from the penalty of sin. That's what we always know. It's more than that. It's also salvation from the power of sin. You know, if... I'm glad I don't know your stories. You must, there must be a lot of wonderful stories here because Philip was telling me, most of you here, a lot of you are first-generation Christians. So it's very interesting. You know why? Because I'm a fourth-generation Christian. My testimony is boring. Yeah, but first-gen Christians, I love talking to people like that. You ask, them, how did you get saved? And they'll tell you that whatever darkness they came from. And so, and they now tell you, that's, I continue to struggle with some of those. 
But I've overcome them. I'm no longer a slave. Whatever it was, whether it was drugs, alcohol, it was uh, uh, sexual immorality, they'll say, I still struggle. But now I'm no longer a slave. That's another part of my salvation and yours. Freedom from the power of sin. And thirdly, that's what Romans 8, 23, 24 is talking about. Even, ultimately, freedom from the presence of sin. You see? That's how wonderful my salvation and yours is. Penalty, yes, we all know that. We're no longer facing the wrath of God. Power of sin, I'm no longer a slave. I'm free. I have a choice not to sin and freedom from the presence of sin. All other hopes spring from our salvation. And why should it bring us hope? Well, because according to 1 John 3 to 3, it says, But we know that when He appears, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who does hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. What is now John talking about when he says that everyone who hopes in the return of Christ purifies himself as He is pure? In other words, Pastor... How should having eternal hope affect us today? In one word, positively. The fact that you are saved from the penalty of sin, the fact you are being saved from the power of sin, the fact that you will be saved from even the presence of sin, it should change the way we live today. I'll give you a hypothetical example. For example, what if your favorite celebrity told you, uh, you know, I'm going to visit your home. When? Uh, if today is Sunday, I'll be at your home Wednesday night to have dinner with you. I don't know who your favorite celebrity is. Uh, for some of you young folks, it's probably some K-pop star, no? Uh, for some of us older guys like me, six decades old, is Dr. John Piper, my favorite author and preacher. Uh, for some of us more mature people, some uh, more mature actors or actresses, and he or she tells you, I'll be at your home Wednesday night. My question to you is this. How will you live from Sunday to Wednesday night? I'm sure you live very differently, no? For example, if Dr. John Piper tells me, I'm going to be at your home, Larry, Wednesday night, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask Mike, can we afford to buy a new set of furniture? Uh, it's not in the budget. Or can we rent? Uh, uh, not enough. Can we borrow the neighbor's nice furniture? And then we will bring out the best china, the best silver. What, what's my point? If there's a certainty that someone who matters a lot to you is definitely going to come, you're going to live differently right now, right? That's what John is saying. Everyone who has the hope of salvation, including salvation from sin itself, when Jesus appears either to the rapture or to death, it purifies us. We live differently right now. And that's why we say having eternal hope affects how we live today positively in every way. In other words, what we believe about the future affects how we live today. What we believe about the future affects how we live today. So I know even Christians struggle with hopelessness. We're not exempt from it. But when we feel hopeless... In Christ, God has given us hope that never ends. That hope is our salvation, and all other hopes spring from it. So, Pastor, how does it become real in my life? Uh, I'm somebody who is single. I'm looking to marry the perfect person, and yet I'm not yet there. And yet I'm struggling in my career. My business is floundering. How does this get real for me? Well, have you, Christ, have you ever received Christ in your heart? Then you must realize that the salvation that Christ has given you has given you hope. This hope should never leave you. Even if your love life flounders, even if your parenting as a young parent is difficult because you've got teens at home, even if your business is floundering, even if your corporate career is somehow never rising to where you wanted it to be after years. It doesn't matter. You've got a hope that never ends because salvation is the source of all your other hope, where God has saved you from the penalty, the power, and the presence of sin. 
There's another struggle we all go through. It's not just hopelessness. It's worthlessness, a feeling of worthlessness. And sometimes it's, it's, it's something that plagues the elderly. You know, when you're above a certain age, you begin to think, well, uh, I wonder how my kids will treat me when they have their own families. I wonder how my kids will see me when I'm no longer helping them and they have to help me. And so you probably know these statistics. They've been mentioned probably more than once here, but the two extremes of age are those ages where people who take their own lives are quite high. The very young and the very old. And many of these are connected either with feelings of hopelessness, got no hope, or worthlessness. I'm nobody. I- I've been trying to be somebody. I've been trying to be seen. I've been trying to be valuable. But in my family, or in my company, in my business, in my clan, in my life, nobody sees my worth. Even Christians struggle with that. When we feel worthless. Our passage will tell us in Christ, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Let me begin again with the context in Ephesians 1 verse 3. Ephesians 1 verse 3, let me read it for you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So when we reach verse 18, that's what Paul was referring to when he said, Again, that you may know, I'm praying, Ephesians, I'm praying SBCF, that you may know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. What does this mean? What is my inheritance? Well, Ephesians 1, 3 tells us that glorious inheritance is everything that belongs to Christ. And uh, it, it, I wish I could tell you it's always material. I wish I could tell you that once you become a Christian, suddenly you have health and wealth. It's not true. Sometimes God will bless you with health and wealth. But to guarantee it when you become a Christian is not biblical. There's nowhere in the Bible that that's what God wanted for you. That's why he saved you. God has bigger things in mind. And every spiritual blessing, friends, is something far bigger. Because, for example, Hebrews 1, 2 tells us that... In these last days, God has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things. So, what are, our, what are some of those things that we inherit in Christ? Okay, when this thing moves. Okay, these are some of those, okay? Not all of them, but some of them. Uh, very quickly, Re- Revelation 21.3, we inherit God. Colossians 1.27, we inherit Christ. Ephesians 1.14, we inherit the Holy Spirit when you become a Christian. 1 Peter 1.5, obviously we inherit salvation. 1 Corinthians 15.57, we will be given glorified bodies. They are prepared for us. Romans 4.13 promises us we will inherit the new world, not the present one, but a new world. In the millennial kingdom. Hebrews 9.15, we inherit the kingdom of God. And staggering as these are friends. I love what 1 Corinthians 2.9 tells us. It tells us the full extent of our blessings in Christ has not yet been revealed. I mean, look at this list. That's awesome, no? It's it's overwhelming. But 1 Corinthians 2.9 tells us, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. You don't know yet the full extent of every blessing God has given you in Christ. So look at this and suddenly compare to health, wealth, prosperity. Suddenly you gain a better perspective, friends. And most of all, not only do we have a glorious inheritance in Christ or from Christ, this is something I'm excited to say. Most of all, we are an inheritance for Christ. Let this sink in. We are God the Father's gift to His Son. Yes, every genuine Christian is the gift of God the Father to His Son. Well, there's a very nice verse that gives us that, and that's, that's found in John 17, 24. There are others, but because of time, I'll just read one. Jesus was praying in John 17, 24, and He said, Father, I desire that they also whom You have given Me 
whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me before, because you love me before the foundation of the world. You're a Christian. God gave you as his gift to Jesus Christ. You know why that staggers me? God would value sinners rescued from destruction who until today battle sins. And I look at myself and me, ako, I'm a gift of God to his son? Wow, that's wonderful, that's grace. It's unbelievable because God sees us already in Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? God looks at you. He doesn't see that, that embarrassing, shameful past that you had before you met Christ. He doesn't see even the sins you did as a Christian because we still do sin. You know what he sees? He sees Jesus Christ in you. He sees us in Christ. And so we are accepted in the beloved. God sees us as we should become in Christ. That Romans 8:29. For whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And whom he predestined, he called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. God sees us already as glorified. It's already done. That's why he can accept us. And you know why that gives me hope? I am not worthless before God. He doesn't see me in my present struggles. Of course he does. He knows but he doesn't give my value, my worth, with my present sinfulness. He sees me as I would be. It's like every father or every parent who raises a child. If you parent, you could actually, you know, when your son or daughter becomes difficult, you could tell them, how in the world did I raise this monster in my home? Or you could say in your heart, son, daughter, you're breaking my heart right now. But I know that if you are in Christ and I'm in Christ and you and I never give up on following Christ, I know in time I will see you at your best and I will not give up raising you in Christ. And what? You know what? You will succeed if that's how you think. That's how God sees us. He treats us as what we should be fully through Christ. That's why Paul prayed this way, friend. He wanted the Ephesians, and now he wants us in SBCF to appreciate the extraordinary value that God has placed on you. He wants you to realize who you are in Christ. Your worth, your value, your self-estimation, your, your self-assessment should be as God sees you, my friend. And this is true of all who are in Christ. God views us in His beloved Son and values us accordingly. Now, somebody put it this way. I love that. I saw this in Facebook. This is a meme. I love it. I want to share this meme with you. It says, by God's grace, I am a prince now, although today I still look like a frog. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great picture of the spiritual life of a Christian. Yeah, you know, and I look at myself in the mirror, I look like a spiritual frog. But you know what? James 1, 23 to 25 is telling us, you're not a frog if you use the right mirror. Because James 1, 23 to 25 talks about the mirror of God's Word. When you're a child of the King, you think you're a frog when actually you're a child of the King. So what is the mirror you should use? The Word of God, the Bible. That's why in James 1.25 it says, I'll read the first part. If anyone is a hearer and not a doer of the Word, it's like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and forgets. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, that's the Bible, and perseveres. A doer who acts, he will be blessed. You will see yourself as you really are. Flawed, imperfect, deeply loved. In fact, the word deeply doesn't do justice to the love of God infinitely, unconditionally, eternally loved. That's who I am. That's who you are in Christ. So when we feel worthless in Christ, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Do not let people tell you who you are 
Do not let even your own inner critic tell you who you are. Let God tell you who you are. In Christ, you are accepted. You're loved in the beloved. With all your flaws. With all your imperfections. That's why you must be in Christ. And third and last, when we feel hopeless in Christ, God has granted us His immeasurable, limitless power. That's Ephesians 1, 18 to 21. Again, Paul used the word that you may know. Then it means the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to working with great might, that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. Before I explain this, I want to ask you a question. What would you do if you personally owned $389 million dollars? Okay? Let your imagination run. What would you do if you own $389 million? Uh, I know Philip, if it's Philip, he said, I'm going to buy a bigger lot for SBCF. Amen. <laughs> Just, but $389 million, friends, is still the world record as of now for the biggest unclaimed lottery ticket in history. In January 2020, in a lottery in Bonita Springs, Florida, somebody won $389 million, a single ticket. You know, sometimes in lottery, six, five, seven tickets will win the same, right? One ticket won it. And you know, the, the law of Florida stated that if no one claims this for six straight months, 180 days, uh, very conveniently, the money goes to Florida, the state of Florida, to the great shock of everybody waiting for the claimant. Nobody claimed it. So until today, that's the biggest unclaimed lottery prize in history. Wow. Why did I say this? Well, you know what? I'm, my imagination is running. Maybe somebody had the ticket, put it in his pocket, and sent it to the laundromat. You know, the washing machine, it comes out. What was my number again? What a waste. Do you know that far more than $389 million, you've got something far more than that. Our pastor talked about that. Paul said that. He said, I want you to know the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. Paul is trying to say, Ephesians, I know you're Christians, but you may not realize how much power you have inside you already. You don't have to ask for it. It's in you. That's what he was telling them. That's why he used that. In other words, how differently will you think or live today if you believe with all your heart that because of God's power, He's given you everything you need, empowered you, to live a life that's pleasing to Him. You don't have to say, oh, Pastor Mao, I cannot get rid of my sin. I cannot get rid of this relationship, which I know is not what God wants me to do. I cannot get rid of this vice. I cannot do this, do that. I cannot witness. I'd rather die than share the gospel. <laughs> and you know what the passage is saying? You've got it in you. You've got the power to do it. You don't have to ask God. You just have to believe God has given it. That's why Paul said that you may know the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe. And uh, earlier today, you know, I love the song that our very young uh, worship leader sang. Yeah, the, the song, uh, if God is for us, then who can stand against us? Right? And if God be with us, then He could stand against that's exactly what this verse is saying. This verse is saying, first of all, it talks about the essence of Christ's power. Let me now move this slide. Okay. The essence of Christ's power. I, I don't want to bore you with this, but there are times when Paul is writing, he struggles for words. When he struggles for words, he tries to combine different synonyms for the same word. As if to say, you know, I've run out of things to say. I, I, can't, I can't describe it well. That's what's actually happening here, friends. In our passage, 
Paul is actually using four synonyms for energy. For example, he used the word power, that's dunamis. He said he's working, that's energeia. He's, he's great, that's kratos, and might is iskos. They all refer to the same thing, force, energy, power. Why? He was trying to drive home to them, you know what, I'm talking about the limitless power of God, and no language can capture it. He's telling them, that's the kind of power you've got in you now. It's not something you have to request, something you have to know, to realize. It's there. It's in us right now. And how did he describe it some more? Well, he said that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand. Far above all rule and authority and power. What's now the effect of Christ's power? The effect of God's power didn't just raise Jesus from the dead. I mean, oh, staggering as that is. It is staggering. The power of God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, I put on my doctor hat. You know what it takes to raise someone from the dead? Uh, if, you've been, if you're in the medical profession, you realize that there are people who say, we can now raise people from the dead. You know, uh, somebody, for example, drowned uh, 20 minutes underwater, so clinically dead. They die. And sometimes, you know, they get revived. And people say, hey, we can now resurrect people. That's not resurrection. Uh, resurrection is when you're supposed to have reached a state of decomposition and you don't decompose. It's actually God changing the very atoms and molecules of your body. That's what happened with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus did not decay as prophesied in the Old Testament. You know why? God changed even the atoms, molecules of his body into a glorified body. So when Jesus rose from the dead, that's the body he had. What kind of power can do that? An imaginable power, staggering power. But the power that Paul describes here, he's saying, don't stop there. I mean, that's unimaginable, but it goes beyond that. It actually raised Jesus all the way to his throne, and then on his throne, he's now ruling above all powers that are in existence and have ever come and will come. That's the effect of Christ's power. We underestimate his power by simple ignorance, but it actually raised Jesus all the way to his throne in heaven. Now, pastor. Does it mean then that when I leave SBCF today, I go out there and I'll never have a problem in my life? No, that's not what it means. This power, friends, it's not that kind of power. It doesn't spare you from going through trouble. It spares you in the midst of trouble. It, one of my favorite passages, I, I really go to this when I struggle personally is Romans 8, 35 to 38. I, I think it's something that you and I should always find as a refuge friend. And if, in fact, if you have your Bible, I, I encourage you to turn there, and I don't care what translation you have. I'm not very picky about that. But Romans 8, 35 to 38. Actually, you can begin at 31, but I'll begin at 35. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we're being killed all day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Then Paul concludes, No, in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the power Paul is talking about. You can be in the midst of trouble, and yet trouble will not Faze you. Do not destroy you. It will not make you lose your faith and run away from God or raise your fist at God and say, how dare you do this? God to me. That's the power Paul is talking about. That should spare you from going through the things everyone else on earth goes through. 
But it's preserved you there. It saves you there. And after that trial, the struggle, the trouble is through, you're a better man, a better woman in Christ. That's what Paul is talking about. And I don't know about you. I'd rather have that kind of power. Rather than the power, you know, sometimes we expect from God. Don't let me go through this, Lord. And God says, no, I want you to go through this. You'll be tougher. You'll be better. So I will not spare you from growing through this. This is the power to serve God and live for God joyfully. How differently will you live today if you believe with all your heart? God would never fail you. And I want you to just chew on this verse as I close. Paul said in Ephesians 3.20, in another prayer, Now to him is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. Friends, when we feel helpless in Christ, God has granted us his immeasurable power. In closing, thoughts of hopelessness, worthlessness, and helplessness attack us even as Christians. But when you feel hopeless, okay, when it moves, <laughs> all right. One more. All right. When we feel hopeless, God gave us hope that never ends in Christ. When you feel worthless, God blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And when you feel helpless, God granted us His limitless power in Christ. Scripture reminds us that we have already been given all that we need in Christ. I have one more story and I'm done. Uh, People say that the story of Indiana Jones is actually based on the life of a man named Heinrich Schliemann. Heinrich Schliemann lived in the late 1800s. He was the son of a German pastor. Now, like, hopefully not all, like a lot of pastors, his father was very poor. So Heinrich Schliemann, however, was a professing believer. At seven years old, he read the Iliad the Odyssey. Now, you young people, if you've read that, you know that this is the story of Troy among them. And, and he got fascinated with it. Heinrich could not get it out of his mind. He said, perhaps the story of Troy is true. Perhaps the Iliad and Odyssey are based on real events. You know what? From seven years old up, he made it the obsession of his life to say the Iliad and the Odyssey are true. And you know what? From seven years old until the age of 51, he made it his life obsession to look for Troy. He found it. He found it in Turkey, and not only did he find it, he took home a lot of the treasures there. Heinrich Schliemann died a famous wealthy man. Why? Because he dared to believe in ancient record, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and acted on his belief. The Bible is better than the Iliad and the Odyssey. Far better. It is the Word of God. And knowing and letting this precious truth change how we think. Romans 12 2 tells us, Be transformed by the renewal of your mind will change how you live and respond to everything you go through in this life. When you feel hopeless, God gave us hope that never ends. When you feel worthless, God blesses us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. When you feel helpless, God granted us His limitless power in Christ. Father, bless Your people. Grant them by the power of Your Holy Spirit to apply Your Word. Help them realize, Father, with all their heart, our hope, our worth, and our help for living in this fallen world are all in Jesus Christ. Thank You for what You've done for us through Him. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen.